beginning at verse 34. I want to speak on the subject tonight of Jaws. And I'll tell you why I call it Jaws in just a moment. Here's the words of Jesus, Matthew 12. Old generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof at the judgment. For by the words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we want to see a sign. Show us a sign so that we can believe in you. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You're only going to get one sign from me. And that's the sign of Jonah, who was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. During the past few months, we've been listening and hearing and reading all about the Hollywood's blockbuster of the year. It's already been viewed by one out of every four Americans. And it's the account of a killer shark in the waters around Martha's Vineyard in New England who swallows victims and delimbs a lot of victims. And they made a motion picture out of it that's shown all over the world. And Time magazine made a cover story of it. And they could only liken it to Jonah and the whale. They could only find that one literary reference in literature of Jonah and the whale. And so the front pages of our newspapers have carried story after story about how people are afraid to go swimming on the beaches in California and Oregon and Washington and up and down the East Coast this past year or this past summer. And then I read the other day about a man in Australia that lassoed a two-ton shark in Australian waters. Well, I can understand that because I've seen a many a shark in Australia. Cliff Barris and I were out swimming one day in the surf and there came running up to us some men and they said, watch out, the sharks are on the way. There was a shark alert up and we were out swimming right where the sharks were supposed to be. And we had a girl in Australia that played in one of our motion pictures, the shadow of the boomerang. She played the part of a nurse and she was a very wonderful girl and she went out with her fiance and the boat got stuck in the water or in the sand. And she got out to help lift the boat off the sand, and she wasn't in water more than waist deep. And a shark came along and took off her leg. And she died before they could get any medical attention to her. And down in Daytona Beach, Florida, they said they had five shark attacks on humans this past year. But this is the year of the big fish story both factual and fictional. And it's interesting to me that at the same time this picture has come out frightening people, we have another picture called the Towering Inferno and another one called Earthquake. Besides all the B pictures with all their horror and monster pictures that are coming out to frighten people. No wonder people are biting their fingernails off and taking tranquilizers and afraid to move in their sleep at night. There's never been such an avalanche of horror and fright, and some of it very sophisticated, to descend upon the human race. And in addition to that, we have to think about the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb. And so we're living at a time when people, Jesus said their hearts would fail them for fear. And today, if ever there was a frightened generation from almost every angle, it is today.
But that's not what I want to talk about. I like Jonah's story, the story of Jonah and the big fish, better than I do Jaws because Jonah was saved, not destroyed, by a big fish. You say, Billy, do you really believe that this fish swallowed Jonah? Notice I'm calling it a fish because the Bible says a big fish was prepared by the Lord. It doesn't call it a whale. It does in this passage in the New Testament, but in the book of Jonah, it says a big fish. I don't know what kind of fish it was. It could have been a big shark for all I know. Do you say, do you believe that actually happened? Yes, I believe it. Why? Because Jesus said it did. And that's all the proof I need. If Jesus believed it, then I believe it. But I believe that it took an even bigger miracle for this particular fish to be on the very spot where Jonah was thrown overboard and then by some mysterious programming of an internal computer to deposit Jonah precisely on the spot where God wanted him to be. And with all the things that are happening in the biological world today, people have much less difficulty crediting this story than they did 50 years ago. 50 years ago, they'd laugh at Jonah and the big fish, but not today, after we've seen Jaws and some of these other things. And after all the scientific and technological achievements, and every once in a while, you'll pick up a newspaper and you'll find that a man or a crocodile or an alligator or something has been swallowed by a big fish and they found him inside the fish, having never been digested, whatever. Now, the story of Jonah is one of the most thrilling stories in all the Bible. It's only four little chapters. In fact, you could read it in about five minutes, maybe ten minutes. And the scripture says that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah and told him to go and preach judgment to the people of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh had 600,000 population. And Nineveh was a city that was very wicked and very godless and very materialistic. It was a permissive society. Sexual immorality was rampant throughout Nineveh. And God said, I'm going to destroy Nineveh. But God said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And I want you to warn them that they are going to be judged in 40 days unless they repent. But Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Every Christian that is here tonight is called to ministry. Yes, you're called. I didn't say you were called to the ministry. I said you were called to ministry. Do you know what the word ministry means? The word ministry means service. Our Lord Jesus Christ came as a servant to serve. And every Christian is called to be a servant, to serve, to serve God, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve his fellow man. Jonah was called of God to go and proclaim the message that God had given him. But secondly, Jonah refused. You know, it's tough to do the will of God. You, you say to God tonight, Lord, I'm willing to do your will. I'll do what you want me to do and go where you want me to go and be what you want me to be, and you're going to find tough going. Because, you see, to do what God wanted him to do, it was several journeys away over mountains and forests and burning deserts. And Nineveh was the wickedest city in the world, a city of 600,000 people. He would face disease and wild beasts and highway robbers, and then when he got there, the people may stone him to death. And Jonah began to run from God. Jonah couldn't take it. So he decided to flee from the presence of God and he went down to Joppa and he got on a boat going to Tarshish and the scripture says he paid the fare thereof. And I want to tell you something. If you start running from the Lord, the devil will always have a boat there for you. And you'll always have the money to pay the way. 
And at first, it'll be smooth going. You'll say, boy, I've made the right choice. I know I'm not doing God's will, but I'm doing what I want to do, and I know that I have made the right choice. But after a while, you're going to start running into some rough seas. Then the storms and the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the rocks and the reefs are going to come. No man ever turned away from God and found happiness and peace and joy that was permanent and lasting. The psalmist asked, whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence? And you know, Jonah thought he had paid the fare. And the captain thought so too. But then the storm came up. And the sailors were frightened. Jonah was asleep. And they said, what's wrong with our ship? Somebody on the ship must have displeased their God. And they began to pray to their gods. Isn't it strange how people began to pray when they're in trouble and maybe they haven't prayed in all their lives? They began to pray. And finally, Jonah told them that he was the one after they'd cast lots and the lot came to Jonah. He confessed that he was running from God. And they said, what do we do with you, Jonah? He said, throw me overboard. They said, no, we'll try something else first. And they began to row and row and row, and they threw everything else over. But the storm got worse and worse, and it looked like the ship was going to be wrecked. So finally, in desperation, they threw Jonah over, and immediately the sea calmed down. And the Bible says that Jonah was caught by a big fish now you think of the jaws that fish had. How wide his mouth must have been. But see, that was a specially prepared fish by God to be there at that precise moment. And let me tell you, when you run from God, you're going to be under God's judgment. And Jonah had three days and three nights in the belly of that fish to think. And brother, let me tell you, he was doing some thinking. And he was doing some praying. He was saying, Lord, save me, help me. I don't know where I am. What's happened? And God said, Jonah, I called you into my service and told you what to do, and you've refused me. Now, Jonah, if you're willing to repent of your sin, I'll give you another chance. And Jonah said, yes, Lord, I repent. I'll keep my vow. And the Bible says on the third day, the fish vomited up Jonah. And Jonah found himself on dry land. And the scripture says, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Now, God doesn't give many of us a second chance like that. But he gave Jonah a second chance. And Jonah ran as fast as he could in every way he could straight to Nineveh. And he went up and down the streets of Nineveh crying out, Repent! Turn to God! Judgment's coming in 40 days! Repent, repent, repent! Of course, he didn't expect anybody to repent. But do you know what happened? That was the greatest and most successful evangelistic campaign in the history of the world. There's never been anything recorded in history like it. The king, the people, 600,000 of them repented and turned to God and God spared Nineveh. Suppose everybody in Washington suddenly repented and turned to God. And the people of America turned to God as we approach this bicentennial year. What a glorious and thrilling thing it would be. And I want to tell you this, if we did it, God would spare us, but if we don't, this country is in for judgment. Tonight, you as an individual can resist God's call to you 
and go deeper and deeper in sin. Or you can turn back to God and obey God and do God's will. Which is it going to be? There are many of you young people that have come to Texas Tech University and you have gotten away from God. You need to come back to Him tonight and God will forgive the past and give you another chance and another moment to serve and follow Him. And I'm going to ask you to do that in just a few minutes. Jonah preached the gospel of judgment. But you know, there was an interesting thing about the message that he preached. There was no mercy in it. He didn't offer the people mercy. He didn't tell them that God loved them. But tonight, I have an opportunity to say to you much more than Jonah said to the people of Nineveh. I can say to you tonight that God loves you and God is a merciful God and God will forgive you. But Jonah didn't say that. He just said, judgment's coming, judgment's coming, repent, repent. And the people repented. And that's why Jesus made this astounding statement. He said, the people of Nineveh are going to rise up at the judgment and testify against you. You see, they repented, never hearing the gospel of mercy and the grace of God in Jesus Christ. But you've heard the gospel of grace in Christ and you have refused to repent. They had never heard that Jesus Christ was to die on the cross for their sins. They didn't know that God loved them so much that he was willing to give his son to die on the cross, but in spite of that, they repented. And Jesus said, they are going to be your accusers on the day of judgment. They will testify against you. But then something very interesting happened. Jonah was upset. He didn't want Nineveh to repent. You see, he was obeying God's call to go and proclaim the message, but his heart still wasn't quite right with God because he was afraid that the Ninevites were going to attack his own country, Israel. And he had prophesied that judgment was coming and he didn't like the people of Nineveh. And he wanted to see judgment come. He wanted to be able to say, I told you so. But he didn't know the mercy and the grace and the love of God that would take these wicked, godless Ninevites and forgive them and change them and transform them if they would only turn to him. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is willing to forgive anybody, even you, whatever your sins are, however bad you've been. God says, I love you. I gave my son for you. I forgive you. But Jonah didn't like that, so he went outside the city and got up on top of a hill and looked down over the city, and he had a, a hard, mean scowl on his face as he looked down on the city, waiting for God to burn it up. And the hot wind and the sun came, and he was tired and he was angry. And the Bible says that God allowed during the night a gourd to grow up by a miracle and covered Jonah and the next morning a worm came and cut it off and it fell and Jonah sat there in the sun and the hot wind blowing on him and God said Jonah you're worried about that gourd and you love that gourd more than you do those 600,000 people of Nineveh and that's how the book of Jonah ends And tonight, many of you are more interested in materialism, your own personal safety. You're interested more in the things that money can buy and the comforts of life and the affluency that we've developed in the United States. You're more interested in that than you are doing the will of God and sharing in the mercy and the grace of God. And let me tell you, you're going to have to make a choice. Jesus said there are two roads of life, the broad road and the narrow road. There are two destinies, heaven and hell. There are two ways to live, two masters, 
materialism and God. Which is your master? Which road are you on? And God has put a little computer down inside of you. You've got a computer system down there. It's your will. And you have the ability to choose whether you're going to serve Christ and whether you're going to serve God and his kingdom and put yourself in the will of God and say, oh Lord, I'll march in your army. I'll march under your flag. I'll go out with love in my hearts to try to help change the world. I'll go out and do your will no matter what it costs, whether it's a burning desert or a steaming jungle. I'll go out even if it means I have to break up with my boyfriend who doesn't live for God. I will go out, O oh Lord, and serve you no matter what the cost. And Jesus said, count the cost. If you're not willing to pay the price, then quit it. Don't even fool with it. It's costly to follow Christ. But I want to tell you the rewards are absolutely unbelievable. The reward of joy and peace and security, knowing that your sins are forgiven, knowing that you're going to heaven, knowing that you're in the will of God, whatever comes and whatever goes. I'm going to ask hundreds of you tonight to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say tonight, I want Jesus Christ into my heart. I want him not only as Savior, but I want him as Lord. I want to put myself in his hands. I want his forgiveness. I want his transforming power. And I'm willing to serve him if he should call me. And I'm going to ask older people and younger people, you need Christ, whoever you are, I'm going to ask you to come and stand. And after you've all come and stood, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature. Then you can go back and join your friends. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. If you've come in a bus or a delegation from a distant city, they'll wait. It'll only take a couple of three minutes for you to come, perhaps more from the upper stands. But get up and come now. Bring your friend with you. Whole families can come together. You need Christ tonight. You want Christ to be yours, and you're ready to pay the price, whatever it costs, to serve and follow Christ. You get up and come quickly from all over this stadium. We're going to wait on you right now men women young people you say well Billy why do you ask us to come every person Jesus called in the New Testament he called publicly he said if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men I'll not acknowledge you before my father which is in heaven it's very important that you come publicly and openly and declare yourself for Christ many people are already on the way you come and join them right now As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You're watching the Billy Graham Classics. Please call the phone number on the screen right now for spiritual help and guidance. As you that are watching by television can tell, there are many hundreds of people that are coming tonight to find Christ as their Lord and Savior or to confess their faith in Christ 
ought to say, Lord, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll be what you want me to be. I wish you could see this great sight that we see from this platform as hundreds and hundreds of young people and older people alike are coming. You can make that same commitment where you are in your hotel room, in your living room, in your bedroom, or perhaps at a bar somewhere. I had a man just two days ago tell me he accepted Christ at a bar watching one of these telecasts, and it changed his life. That could happen to you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. There's only one life, only one hope. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to a familiar passage of Scripture, Galatians, the sixth chapter, Galatians, the sixth chapter and the 14th verse. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I under the world. Just after the war, Cliff Barrows and I uh, came together. He led the singing and I did the preaching. And his wife and my wife and the four of us went to England. And we lived in England during the winter of 1946 and 47. Now London was almost totally devastated. And one of the things I remember is that in all that devastation after the war and all the rubble, there stood St. Paul's Cathedral, and on top of St. Paul's was a cross. I remember when Coventry Cathedral was being built because it had been destroyed during the war, and it was nearing completion. A cross was lowered by helicopter and placed on the top. A huge 25-foot wooden cross stands above the fields of the buried horror of Belson concentration camp. A tiny cross placed there by Sir Edmund Hillary, the first man to conquer the peak of mountains, is buried on the snow and the ice at the summit of Mount Everest. Now you, many of you, are very religious and you have embossed upon your Bibles a cross or you wear a cross around your neck. And the thing that I want to ask you tonight is this, what does the cross mean to you? Why do all the Catholic churches and all the Protestant churches have a cross? That's the one thing we agree on is the cross. The whole Christian world looks to the cross. Why did Paul say that he gloried in it more than anything else in all the world? Paul could have gloried in his education. He was one of the most educated men of his time. He could have gloried in his religion. He was very religious. He could have gloried in his ability to speak several languages. He was fluent in several. He could have gloried in the fact that he was a Roman citizen, but he didn't. Or he could have gloried in certain things about Jesus Christ other than the cross. His spectacular, miraculous birth, born of a virgin, the Virgin Mary. Or the great teaching of Christ, 
Even today, educators say there's never been a teacher like Jesus Christ or his great social work, his compassion for the poor and the needy, his concern for the hungry and the sick, his amazing resurrection from the dead, his future glory when he's going to rule the world and his kingdom is going to come. He could have gloried in any of those things, but he said, no, I glory only in the cross. And he said, God forbid that I should glory in anything else except the cross. Why? Well, I want you to think a moment and look at that cross. It was the most cruel of all punishments because the victims sometimes would hang there for several days. It took them several days to die. And on this occasion, they were crucifying three people, two thieves, murderers, and Jesus in the middle. The soldiers entered the guardhouse and brought Jesus with the two other condemned men. They were beaten 33 times or 39 times on their bare backs with leather thongs with steel pellets on the end. A crown of thorns had been put on Jesus' brow. A cross was laid upon his back. The procession started. Jerusalem was filled with a carnival-like atmosphere at that time. And the procession went through the main streets so that all might see that the criminal and be warned of a similar fate if he broke the laws of Rome. A big crowd was following. Just a few of Jesus' friends were following. And Jesus became weakened by the loss of blood and he fell. And so Simon of Cyrene, an African, helped him carry the cross. The soldiers went quickly and methodically about their task of driving home the nails in his hands and the spike through his feet. The crowd mills around jeering. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. They laughed and they mocked and they made fun of him. Come down. Do just one more miracle, they said. But he didn't do it. He stayed there. And you know why he stayed there? Because of you. Because he loved you. Because you see, only in Jesus Christ can we find forgiveness of sins. He was bearing our sins on the cross. People ask me constantly as they write, is there any hope for me? Can Christ save me? Prostitutes, alcoholics, robbers, murderers, prisoners, people filled with racial prejudice, people who hold in their hearts anti-Semitism. Is there any hope for me? People who have done many evil things, both corporately and privately. Is there any hope for me? A bishop of a church in another country came to me one time, some years ago now, and he told me that he did not believe that he was saved. He said, I've been to theological school in England. He said, I've been a bishop now, and he told me how many years. But he said, I have so many doubts that, I'm, that my sins are forgiven and I'm going to heaven. And he said, I've come to you to ask you if you would pray for me and pray with me. And very simply, I talked to him just like he was a little child, as though he had never heard the gospel before. Tears came streaming down his face, and he got on his knees, and he prayed a very simple prayer, which indicates to me that you can even be a clergyman, be in the church. I know a man in St. Louis, pastor of a large church. He was converted to Christ under his own preaching. He'd never known Christ, and suddenly the Spirit of God spoke to him. I know a man here in Boston who was pastor of a church that was dying. He had a brilliant education from one of your great theological seminaries here. And his little daughter got sick, and he thought she was dying. And he said, Lord, he said, if you will raise up my daughter from now on, I'll turn to the Bible and preach nothing but the Bible and accept your word as the word of faith. And that happened. Within a year, his church was packed out. Now he's pastor of a great church in Florida. Some of you know him. Paul gloried in the cross because it is the only way of salvation. 
Nothing else will save. The cross is the only way. There is a way, the Bible says. Oh, there, there are the ways of salvation. So we're taught by many teachers that seemeth right. But the end thereof is the way of death. There's only one way, by the cross. And that's one reason why people don't like to talk about the cross or the exclusiveness of salvation. We like to think that there are many ways. And there are many ways that people worship and there are many ways that people pray. And God does hear the prayers of all people all over the world who ever calls upon the name of the Lord is going to be heard. But there's only one way outlined in the Bible. And I, as a minister of the gospel, must declare unto you what the apostle Peter said. There's therefore now no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. Jesus said, as I've already quoted, enter in at the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go in thereof. Because narrow is the gate, and hard is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Notice, he says, it's hard. It's not easy to follow Christ. You pay a price. He said, if you're not willing to deny self and take up the cross, you cannot be my follower. You see, we would like something cheap and something easy. His demands were so high that many people refused to go with him any further. They'd go so far and then they'd turn away. Because he turned to a crowd one day and said, count the cost. Count the cost. If you follow me, that means that I become Lord of your life. If you follow me, that means you become my learner, my disciple, and you must do my commands. You've got to love your neighbors yourself if you follow me. If you follow me, you've got to be concerned about the needs of the world. If you follow me, You've got to be willing to take up the cross. I'm going to die on a cross. I'm going to be executed. That means that you're willing to go back to your school and back to your home and back to your neighborhood and tell the people that you know Christ and let them see Christ in you. And that won't be easy. But if you'll do that, he'll be with you. He doesn't ask us to live the Christian life alone. I cannot live the Christian life. I'll be honest with you. I cannot do it. But Christ can live it through me if I will let him. And he can produce the fruit of the Spirit. He can give me a love and a joy and a peace that I'll never find anywhere in this world. He can give me the certainty of my eternal life. Now Jesus also warned us that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not preached in your name? And in your name we've cast out demons. And in your name we've done many wonderful works. And then he said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see, you can go to church. You can be a good person. And maybe really never know Christ. I know many people that live moral lives that are agnostics and even atheists. There comes a point, there comes a moment sometime, somewhere when you must receive Christ into your heart. Paul gloried in the cross because it expresses the depth of sin, because it shows the love of God, because it's the only way of salvation, and fourthly, because he knew that it gave a new dynamic to life. Once you've been to the cross, you can never be the same. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new, the Scripture says. You'll never be the same once you come to Christ. I remember the night I came to Christ. I stood with about three or four hundred other people, made my commitment to Christ, and while I was standing there, I felt like a fool. 
I started to turn around and go back. A woman next to me was weeping and I didn't have any tears. I had no emotion at all except fear, afraid that, of standing in front of so many people. But I went home that night and I remember it was a moonlight night. And we lived on a farm. And I looked out across the field, and across the woods. And I knew something had happened to me that night. I didn't know what, if you'd asked me the next day what had happened to me, I could not have told you. I now know. That first step was so weak and my faith was so weak and I had so many doubts. But my goodness, the transformation that began working its way into my life over a period of time was so tremendous and it's still working and it's still growing and I'm still learning and it gets better every day. And then f fifthly, fifthly, it's a motivation for service, a motivation for service. Did you see Mother Teresa getting that award? And then she won the Nobel Peace Prize two or three years ago. And she's won so many awards. And she said, I owe it all to the cross. Martin Luther King received the Nobel Peace Prize and they asked him something about it and he said, it was built upon my father's evangelical preaching. I know his father and I knew Martin Luther King, of course. And his father always preached the gospel and believed in the cross. And so did Martin Luther King, Jr. Do you know Christ? It's a motivation for service. What motivates you? To go out and help the hungry and the poor and the oppressed. My son spends his time, a great deal of it in the third world, helping the poor and the needy going to little dispensaries and little hospitals and sending doctors to help them. And he was out on one of those boats in the China Sea helping pick up those refugees a couple of years ago. What motivates him? Why does he go to some place in Africa, or go all through New Guinea, or go through India, or Bangladesh, or some of these places to try to help? Because he loves Christ. It's Christ that motivates him. What motivates you? Or do you have any motivation at all to help others? And then Paul gloried in the cross because he knew that it guaranteed a future life. The cross was followed by the resurrection, but God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And the scripture tells us in a grand anthem in the book of Revelation, the fifth chapter, and they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by Thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on earth. What a glorious future we have because of the cross. Some of you are watching by television. Pick up that phone and call that number that's there right now and talk to the person and tell them your need and share with them and they will talk to you. And you can find Christ tonight or you can find help for your problem or your need, whatever it is. Now, what was the attitude of the crowd that was there that day? Christ dying on the cross. First, there was the attitude of apathy. Sitting down, they watched him there. That's indifference. Many here this evening who are completely indifferent to what I'm saying and to the gospel. The mockings, the abuse, and the atrocity of that ancient pagan mob were less painful to Christ than the indifference of a modern world upon which the light of the gospel has been shining all these years. Here in New England, no place in all the world has had more gospel than you've had in your past history. How many today are indifferent? Too much is given, much is required. You see, more is going to be required of you. Where you've had the gospel for so many years and so many Bibles and so many churches and now the television and the radio, then those people in China, 
or people in other countries that don't have the gospel as freely as we have it today. And then there's the attitude of the skeptic and the cynic. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, oh, you that destroy the temple and you build it in three days, say to yourself, come down from the cross. And there are skeptics here tonight, I know that. We've had many a skeptic come to the meeting and have his life changed. I remember the great scientist from the University of Minnesota who came. Skeptical. But three days after that service, he found Christ and became a wonderful Bible teacher on the faculty at the university. Then there's the attitude that saves. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister. And then there was the attitude of the centurion who said, Truly, this is the Son of the living God. My wife was born and reared in China. And in Chinese, the word come is written with three characters, each of which is a cross with a person on it. We're translating tonight in Chinese, both Mandarin and in Cantonese. The cross in all languages means come to the cross, find salvation. Come to the cross and find peace. Come to the cross and find forgiveness. Come is the invitation of the whole Bible. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come to the cross. I'm asking you tonight to come to the cross. You say, well, what do I have to do? Three things. Christ has paid the price on the cross. He's been raised from the dead. That is the heart of what is called the good news, the gospel. The good news is that God loves you. He gave His Son to die for you. He will forgive you of your sins. He will give you eternal life tonight. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. Tonight. That's the good news, but you must receive it. How do you receive it? First, by repenting of sin. That means to turn, to change your thinking, to change your mind, to change your attitude, and to change your way of living. Let Christ come and be in control of your life. That's repentance. Saying to God, I have sinned and I'm sorry for it. Forgive me. That's repentance. But then you must by faith receive him. And that word faith may trip you up. Faith means that you totally commit to Christ. Just as I'm standing on this platform and my body is committed to this platform, so you stand with your whole life and everything you have, you put on Christ. Your hope is in Him and Him alone. He becomes the one that you trust totally and completely for your salvation. There was a minister preaching on the thief on the cross once and some man yelled from the congregation and said, what about that thief on the cross? And quick as a flash, the minister said, which thief? Because you see, one died and was lost and one died and was saved. And that's the only story of deathbed repentance in the whole Bible. So you better not wait. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise you tomorrow. And Jesus said, you must do it publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I will not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. That's the reason I ask people to come forward publicly. You see, your coming forward doesn't actually save you. It's coming forward as a symbol of an inward decision you're making in your heart. You're coming and standing with Christ at the cross and saying by coming, I do repent of sin. I do want to change. I do want His forgiveness. I do want a new life. I'm going to ask you right now to get up out of your seat and do what we've seen thousands through New England do. I'm going to ask you to come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I want sin forgiven. I want to know when I leave this stadium that Christ is with me and that Christ has forgiven me and that I'm going to heaven. 
If you have a doubt in your mind, don't you leave this stadium till you've settled it because you may never have another moment when your heart is this close to the kingdom of God. You're not here by accident. I believe you're here in the providence of God. You get up and come right now. We're going to wait on you. Hundreds of you, quickly. I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium. This is a very holy and sacred moment. And you be in an attitude of prayer. You can bring your friend with you. If you're with friends or relatives or you've come in one of those buses, they'll wait on you. You get up and come and make this commitment. Here in Boston, we've already seen hundreds of people. And you that are watching by television, pick up the telephone and call the person on the other end and have a talk with them. You see that number there. As these are coming forward this evening here at Nickerson Field, take time to call that phone number on your screen. Write the number down, and if the line is busy, call back. We want to help you now. watching by television can see here in Boston, Massachusetts, many hundreds of people coming to make their commitment to Jesus Christ. You can make your commitment right where you are. Just say yes to Christ. Pick up the telephone and call that number. God bless you. And be sure and go to church next Sunday. Night after night, we have seen hundreds of people respond here at Nickerson Field to commit their life to Jesus Christ. This is also a moment of decision for you. Make that telephone call right now by calling the number on your screen. Trained counselors are standing by ready to help you. If the lines are busy, just wait a few moments and call again. We'll be there as long as the calls keep coming in. Be sure and join us again tomorrow night for another telecast from the Boston New England Crusade and a special feature that Mr. Graham wants to present to you. Call a friend and ask them to share the program with us. Until then, Cliff Barrows here saying good night and may God richly bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. We still have a window of opportunity to reach a lost and dying world with the truth of God's love. It's not too late. We've got an opportunity to tell others about Jesus Christ. What are you going to do with it?